You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. I'd like to introduce Greg Stevens of Fidelity. And he is our uh, a great moderator for the panel, and uh, he'll uh, take it from here. Greg. Well, we'll have to see about the great moderator thing here. Before <laughs> that's a that's a lofty goal for me to uh, today. But uh, good morning and welcome. I uh, hope everyone had a good opening night at the Wild Horse Saloon. You know, special thanks to OIC for putting that on. We had a great time for sure, and uh, looking forward to today as well. So, as Antonio mentioned, my name is Greg Stevens. I work at Fidelity Investments. I'm vice president of options, uh, you know, at the firm there. Today with me, we've got uh, Sean Feeney, you know, from NASDAQ, Ravi Jain from Sterling Tech, and also Ming Zhao from Atomic Vaults. Um, we've got a great panel discussion today. We're going to be looking a little bit at, you know, where the retail investor is today and where they might be going in the future. But before we get started there, why don't we just take a moment and uh, you know, hear from our panel. Just quick introductions. Yeah, uh, Sean Feeney, I lead the options business at NASDAQ. Been in NASDAQ for around six and a half years. Been in the industry around 25. Uh, Ravi Jan, um, I've been in the options industry for several decades as a, uh, on the trading side, vol and quant strategies. Uh, risk management, and uh, as a technology innovator, and now I am uh, Chief Product Officer at Sterling Trading Tech. Hi, I'm Ming Zhao. Uh, I'm the co-founder at Atomic Vaults. We do fractional options for retail. We work with brokerages, um, and before this, I was at Point72 as a long short analyst. All right. Well, thank you. Um, and let's get started. So we, w- we want to kick this off, you know, thinking about, um, you know, you know, as we think about this past year, I mean, we've had a very different trading environment, you know, from, you know, say, really, the, you know, the, the previous five or ten years. Uh, markets have been volatile. We, we've been in and out of bear market territory. We've seen an interest rate environment where the Fed is raising aggressively to fight inflation. You know, many of our first-time retail traders, you know, haven't... Um, you know, you know, haven't seen this, and quite honestly, many seasoned, you know, uh, retail, you know, investors haven't seen this as well. So, you know, Robbie, with, with this as our backdrop, what, what are you seeing from the retail investor? Sure. So, um, clearly, we had that big retail revolution, as we uh, referred to in one of our conversations, yeah. and um, that's somewhat, um, you know, we've seen a little bit of downturn in that. Um, retail investors are, you know, are. There's a little dip in activity. There uh, seems to be a subtle shift from the high volatility names to uh, ETF or even indices. Um, and so it begs the question, um, was the whole retail revolution a uh, flash in the pan and uh, is not sustainable or is not going to continue? And um, uh, I think that's probably on a lot of people's minds. You know? uh, so I'd like to take you back about 23 years um, ago when I first uh, co-founded iVolatility. Back then, we had predicted that the retail revolution is coming, retail options is coming. Of course, the dot-com crash happened, and we were wrong. And we had to wait 18 years, almost 18 years, before it sort of came back. Uh, and this time, I think it's extremely different. First of all, the barriers to entry are extremely low. It's, extreme, it's frictionless to open an account, start trading, and be on your mobile all day long, wherever you are, and trade. Um, secondly, there's a tremendous amount of awareness among retail. Every youngster I speak to knows about options. They've heard about options from their friends or from social media or whatever they're you know, chatting with other people on. And so they're fearless about trying and playing with a little bit of money and, and investing, you know, trading options. 
Um, and then, of course, the industry has recognized that they're a real force, and they've rea- reacted, responded with products, with services, etc. So, and of course, we know that the pandemic was the perfect catalyst to just yeah. blow this thing up. So, um, given all that, I think the retail participation is here to stay. I, I don't think it's going away. I think we're going to see some ebb and flow and dips, but uh, I, I really think now is it's, it's a real force and it's going to stay. Yeah, I think if there was any question on, on whether the retail investor, the new investor, the young investor are here to stay, I mean, has been answered over the, over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, Ming, how about you? Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, so I have some firsthand experience on the social media sites, uh, observing what the new retail likes to talk about uh, online and how they, you know, socially trade. Um, so I've seen, you know, the TikToks. I've also uh, seen and I also post on Twitter. Um, and there's, you know, there's a, tons of interest on inflation. There's been tons of interest on Fed, and um, and everyone is surprisingly very well educated, I think, compared to 10 years ago, let's say. Um, And the age at which folks have started trading has also been a lot younger. Um, And even though these kind of new traders don't have a ton in wallet share, that will certainly increase over time. And uh, even though, like, we can call it, if you know, bear markets today and, like, 2021, bull markets, whatnot. Yeah. And even though, you know, if we compare to 2021, the volumes might be lower, uh, I think it's kind of a rising tide floats all boats scenario where, like, the highs are higher, the lows are also higher. So uh, definitely, I think, here to stay as well. Yeah, I think it's interesting that, um, I mean, education's really led this effort in communication. And, Robbie, to your point, I mean, the barriers to entry are much lower than they were five, ten years ago. And, I mean, social media is you know, the, the thing that I focus on a little bit because that's where, I mean, a lot of information is being disseminated. And I think firms, if they weren't there over the last couple of years, they're there now. I mean, we started to see even at Fidelity, I mean, we have, you know, accounts and all the social media, making sure that, you know, in Reddit, you know, if a thread starts, that it doesn't get a million posts, you know, or a million looks, you know, without having the right information in there. So we have to really be where they're at and, and focus on uh, what we can do to support, you know, this group. John, how about you? Yeah, I, Ravi mentioned, you know, the, the, the boom, and that really started in 2019 with the reduction of commission costs, and then all of a sudden we find ourselves in the pandemic era, and then through the pandemic era into the meme stock revolution, and then through that into what was the peak of retail volume was right around July of 2021, where retail, retail was on one side of around the mid-60%, like 63% or so, of all option volume in the multi-list space. was you know, absolutely pure retail. Classically, that's been somewhere in the low to mid-40s right. as far as overall retail volume as a percentage of the market. You know, some of that's not necessarily your, your average you know, trader that's either performing, you know, yield enhancement strategies or, or portfolio protection or, you know, it, we, we've certainly moved into a meta where today we have a bit more speculative trading. There's a lot of volume and the duration of the retail investor cycle has continually shortened over time. You know, in 50 years ago, there were three months, six months and nine month options. You know, 50 years and two days ago when options were launched and the first, uh, first option contract traded in, in Xerox. I think it was the Xerox 160 call. Um, yeah, and, and it was the July 160 call in Xerox. And uh, you know, I, I think we'll get a little bit into uh, how they trade these options a little bit later. But you know, that's, that's been the experience so far. Um, the last 18 months has seen a slight decline in, in, that, in that percentage. But we're still, we're still hanging in the mid-40s. Yeah, I mean, I think we still, you know, I mean, we're seeing really good participation from the retail um, you know, you're from the, you know, the retail investor. And I think, you know, Ming, you mentioned something about, you know, the rising tide lifts all ships and, you know, same thing when it moves lower. You know, typically in, you know, in, in down markets, you know, people have a little less to trade. They pull back a little bit. And I don't think it's, uh, I know, I think uh, Mr. Schwartz mentioned something yesterday about, uh, um, you, know, the, you know, overall retail volume being down. I think it's just you know, a natural ebb and flow. I, th- I think, you know, when, when we look at this group, I mean, you know, we, we had a question that we were looking at that said, you know, will involvement of retail, you know, will it persist and grow or is it fleeting? 
And I think that um, you know what we're seeing is you know, we think it's going to grow, but you know it's going to you know have the highs and the lows you know, that we uh, yeah that uh, that we're seeing today. Yeah, it's the education, it's the frictionless experience, mm -hmm. it's the tools that are available to the retail trader today that far surpass the tools that I started using on the floor in 1999. Right? right. I mean, retail retail traders have that at their fingertips every single day, and they can they can do portfolio analysis that I couldn't even dream of when I first started. Yeah. Yep. And it's a response from the industry of new products, new technology, et cetera. Um, without the industry resp responding, you'll lose the interest of the retail. Yeah. Agreed. All right. Well, I want to shift focus just a little bit um, you know, on the retail investor and talk about you know, the risk in the market today. Mentioned that you know, many of these new and even some more seasoned you know, retail investors you know, haven't had you know, a real opportunity to see a market like this where it's moving down or it's very volatile. You know, interest rates you know, are playing a bigger you know, part in that, um, you know, mean, you know, as an educator and entrepreneur, what are you seeing, you know, the, the retail, you know, investor? I mean, you're on social media, you're seeing, you know, them, uh, you know, talk a little bit more about that, but how are they looking at risk? Yeah, um, as mentioned yesterday on a panel, when you have very little, you're extremely vigilant about asset allocation. You're extremely vigilant about, you know, my position. I can only have this much go into this position because, Otherwise, you know, I can't diversify, and that's a problem. And I think a lot of them have experienced gambler's ruin for, you know, for what it's worth, uh, you know, very early on in the pandemic, if that's when they started. Mm -hmm. um, so now they're hyper aware of that. And um, in order to do, to diversify their portfolio, and that's one of the goals now, I think, is because they're like, okay, I got, you know, either I you know, kind of got screwed during the meme stock or, or whatnot, and now I have to change my ways. And uh, maybe some of them are doing passive or trying passive, and, but, you know, everyone, everyone likes to have their own views, so kind of going back intermittently to active and, um, and just kind of broadly just diversifying now. Like, there's, there's a lot more interest in stocks like Costco. It's not just, not just tech anymore, right. so... All right, Ravi. Um, you know, Sterling. You know, you know, Sterling's uniquely positioned to help you know firms, not only you know retail investors, manage you know some of that ongoing volatility in the markets. Uh, what are you seeing? So we're seeing uh, on the risk side um, a significant amount of interest in risk technology um, from the firm side because um, on the on the actual uh, retail client, they're predominantly long options. So there's no market risk and credit risk, you know, really. The, the risk that their accounts pose to firms or to, to brokers and clearing firms is the exercise risk. And that's really uh, something that we're seeing a lot of attention being paid to. Um, you know, before if there was, you had a few contracts, a few, you know, not too many clients who's a, uh, who had options that were in the money. You could manage it more or less manually or with limited amount of technology. Today, with retail brokers having lots of accounts and lots of expirations, every day they're dealing with this issue of how to manage uh, expiration risks so that a retail client doesn't get into an exercise that they don't have the equity to support. Right. So we're seeing a lot of interest in that. Um, on, the, uh, on, the, on the long side, the, you know, just long, it's, it's pretty easy calculations. Um, but as we're going to start offering, as the industry starts offering spreads and even shorting of options, uh, the calculations become much more complicated. And um, some, some firms have responded to this by just saying, we're going to shut down or liquidate at 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock. And that's not necessarily the best experience because if investors bought an option that expires at 4 p.m., they want to be able to hold the option to last close to 4 p.m. as possible. And so the solutions have to be technology solutions that can uh, automate that, um, automate the, the uh, closing out, the liquidation, et cetera. So we're seeing a lot of interest on, from that perspective. The other side is, um, you know, retail might be buying a lot of options, but then somebody's selling to them. And so brokerage firms are finding that a lot of their normal traders, uh, uh, prop traders, semi-professional traders, et cetera, they're the ones who are taking the other side, and they're building large, short positions on these options. And so firms have had to really up their game in terms of uh, risk management, real-time intraday risk management, systems that can um, create better internal house policies um, is becoming really, really important. 
And then lastly, and probably what I think is probably the most important, is proactive risk management. Uh, we're not seeing enough of that, I think. We're seeing a lot of talk about that in terms of um, proactively reducing leverage on the highly high, the high risk names, you know. Um, the industry still, brokers still t- tend to be a bit reactive. They, you know, when after the fact, they'll jump in and start, you know, raising mar- margin rates or reducing leverage. But um, uh, I think it's going to be important to be more proactive on that so that you prevent the, the retail traders or prevent your, your traders that are taking the other side to get into trouble, you know? All right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, in, in JJ's panel, they mentioned operational risk, you know, yesterday. And, uh, you know, some of the volumes that we've seen from retail, you know, investors come in, I think, you know, I don't know if it caught us by surprise, but it was definitely something that we had to, you know, take a, take a look at. And with all the additional accounts, with the, with the, um, uh, the risk management that, that comes with that, you know, can the account support an exercise? Can it, you know, support... You know, an assignment. If if naked at that point, take some you know real time calculations uh, and and to be able to do that quickly. If you weren't automated, you know, in that process, you needed to get there quickly in order to, you know, be able to uh, just to manage the influx of accounts. Or you're in that situation where you have to do something a little bit more dramatic. And whether that's you know shutting down trading at, at three o'clock, two o'clock, you know, start liquidations, you know, much earlier than you might have. You know, in the past, you had to get in front of this, yep. you know, th- th- this quickly. And, and I think as an industry, we performed really well, you know, when, when, it, come, when it comes to this. Um, and, you know, with just the additional volumes, you know, that, that, that came in, I think they mentioned uh, 50 to 60 percent, you know, of average daily volume, zero DTEs now. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more uh, in, in a bit. But you have to be on top of your game. You know, one follow-up, you know, Ming and, and, and Ravi, for you, you know, as well, is we, we mentioned that we're long only, um, you know, or we're predominantly, it seems. That, I mean, have we seen a shift, you know, from that retail investor to doing a little bit something more complex, like a spread, you know, you know ma- making that, that transition? Uh, I guess I'll start yeah. with that. <laughs> yeah. um, I think, so, uh, before I get to spreads, there's... Uh, speaking of long only, there's, I guess, also a, a difference in complexity, I guess, kind of in the retail trader's mind between calls and puts. <laughs> right. Uh, not surprisingly, maybe this is tied to when, you know, options came out. Uh, as stated yesterday, only calls were available, right. so everyone thought, you know, up only market. Um, so 2021, everyone thought, you know, up only market. So a lot more call volume than puts. And then um, when the downturn happened, just straight up buying puts was one of the very few ways that a lot of retail traders had to express a bearish view on anything. Um, so I think uh, overall just general kind of increase from or evening out between calls and put volume. Um, I think that the majority of uh, retail traders, at least that I've seen on social media, are not yet, if they were not at the point where they were doing spreads, if they were kind of like still you know one to two years in their investing experience, um, haven't yet gotten to spreads, but obviously there's, I know there's tons of platforms that are, um, you know, spreads focus and uh, focus on, you know, essentially converting or uh, catching the, the trader that goes from just long only to, to more complex strategies. And the increase in more complex strategies being employed by retail, you know, it, it all kind of ties in, right? Because that introduces some of this operational risk. Okay. You know, short a call spread, moves to a strike, don't have enough money in the account in order to cover physical delivery, et cetera, right? So, you know, the proactive risk management on an intraday basis towards expiry that the retail firms have needed to employ, you know, definitely poses operational risk. You know, additional risk around the expiry cycle and specifically what might happen after the close, you know, given the access to the retail, the retail investor about what they can do post the close and post what the expiry date is, right? So contrary exercise intent notification isn't something that's you know, necessarily often spoken about you know, amongst the, the retail community. Um, you know, so you know, as the more complex strategies being employed by retail continue to expand, you know, we as an industry need to continue to step on the gas as far as our educational effort you know, naturally, Ravi mentioned retail tends to be long convexity. You know, so from a 
you know, fr from a market risk perspective, that tends to be muted. Um, you know, just naturally being long options, you can only lose the premium that you spend. But then, you know, it's about strike selection and portfolio optimization, you know, more so today than it has been in the past, right, where it would typically be, I'm long a stock, I need to generate additional yield on, on the stock and to sell an upside cover call, right? So, you know, and, and that education has run its course, and we've seen, you know, a tremendous amount of growth and, you know, a lot of the, the wealth management and RAA community, which is still retail, only a different style of a little bit more sophisticated retail and certainly not pro-tail, you know, as we kind of you know, further segment the, you know, the segment down uh, you know, in, into, into these kind of microchasms of, uh, of activity. But you know, when we're thinking about risk top down, uh, I, I think that you know, we do an amazing job as a industry in that educational effort, but you know, we need to keep pushing hard and making sure that not only the information is out there, but that the right information is out there accurate information is out there because, you know, there, there has certainly been quite a bit of rhetoric in the media, especially as of late, uh, you know, surrounding some of the risk items and potential systemic risk items to the market that, you know, are either pure fiction or just a great headline, you know, or clickbait or whatever. So, uh, you know, we're, we're on the right track. Keep, uh, keep down the road. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important. I mean, you mentioned, you know, education and, you know, we all have to do our part. It's a partnership between, you know, firms and, you know, the exchanges and everyone who's involved, especially to get the right information out, you know, at, at the right time, whether it's, you know, whether it's, you know, a corporate action, you know, because we've seen a lot of, um, you know, we've seen a lot of posts, you know, about, you know, the recent activities and the corporate actions, you know, what is it, how does it work, and, you know, the information, you know, can, can really go the wrong way really quickly. And so all of us, you know, doing our part, I think, you know, we've done a really good job of, of getting the right information, you know, out at the right time to the right people. Um, and we need to continue to do that. We have to meet, you know, these retail investors where they're at. If we don't, you know, whether that's social media on our platforms, engaging them as they're going through the process, making sure that they know an earnings announcement is, is coming. I mean, one of the common, you know, questions we, we get is, well, which expiration do I choose? You know, how, you know, what's the right process, you know, for that? And if you're looking at an option chain, I mean, it, it is very much uh, intimidating to that new user with, all the strikes, all the expirations, and you know we have you know we have content you know on our website you know that helps you know you at least start to define you know that process you know to make sure that we're getting you know because the worst thing for them to do is to choose the wrong one, lose some money, and then we may have lost them you know for for good at that point. So constantly engaging, constantly you know doing the education um, is 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 really important. And yeah, one thing that we haven't mentioned just yet. Uh, you know, that tends to get referenced because each year it becomes more and more true. You know, the retail investor has never had it better. We have a yeah. great market structure in this industry today, right? And you know, we spoke about market structure and what's happening on the equity side, how that might filter in to the option space within the next few years. You know, but the wholesale construct that we have within this market today works wonders for the retail participant. They do receive a tremendous amount of price improvement. The experience that they're getting continues to be positive. We see the growth because of that positive experience continue down a, a, a path to more continued growth. And the introduction of new product is really what's taken us on this next leg up. You know, we're up as an industry you know, over 100% in the last five years as far as our overall market volumes. And that happened precipitously. And due to a host of outside factors, but also because of the work that's being done by everyone in this room in educating you know, the, the constituents or let's say, the participants of this industry that either aren't here yet, need to know a little bit more, you know, are investors but don't understand much about options. And you know, the, that, that education that we continue to do is just you know, it, it is paramount to continued growth of this industry. All right. So now we want to take an opportunity to, to, to do a little look back, but then also to, to look forward what's to come, you know, with, within the options market for the retail investor. And one of the topics um, that, that has been, uh, you know, ongoing, you know, at, at this conference, and uh, no, it's not strike price proliferation. You know, it is actually uh, uh, zero DTEs. You know, you know Sean, I, I want to start with you here. I mean, 
you know, how has you know, that changed the market, and how is it going to evolve the market going forward? I have opinions. <laughs> I, I, I actually want to get a little crowd participation. Repeat after me. Zero DTE is not a product. <laughs> no, nobody? Okay. Um, it's a point in time. It just so happens to be the point in time on the last day of an expert cycle. We understand that as professionals in the industry. The general public does not, right? So it is so important for us to, to educate on zero DTE uh, and specifically the last day of an expiry cycle. And you know, as, as we start to in, introduce additional product that might increase the amount of quote unquote zero DTE trading that, that is occurring, just to throw out some statistics, just looking at names like Amazon, Apple, Google, Netflix, and Meta, if you go back to well before the volume increase, and you look at just the Friday, you look at the volume profile of those symbols, which are, were the most actively traded equity symbols in the market, 40% of the option volume in those symbols, going back to, I want to say 2014, I think is where I, where I looked at data from, it's around 40% of the volume on the day of expiry. Well, guess what? We're going to introduce additional expiry cycles and you know, I'd really love to change the way that we're talking about things like dailies, because these are not daily options. These are weekly options with non-standard expiries, non-Friday expiries. They're listed anywhere between two weeks and three years in the past, and then they happen to expire. Right? So as we introduce expiry cycles that, that are going to expire on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you know, we're going to see an increase in the amount of options that are traded on those days. It isn't alarming. Yeah, again, retail is long convexity. So from a systemic risk perspective and from, a retail, from the retail lens, there is no additional systemic risk added to the marketplace in that construct. When professionals are absorbing this risk and institutions see that volatility is leaking higher because there is an outsized amount of buying in, in the marketplace, they're going to step in as institutions, be they prop, be they fund, be they market makers, and they're going to push the volatility back down you know, through selling options to stasis, and we, we find equilibrium, and that's markets. right? And, they're, and those professionals are amazing at managing their own risk you know, through their own firms, risk management processes, and we haven't seen a market maker in the options industry have a really significant issue because of poor risk management. Everybody does a great job at staying afloat. You know, we have seen entrants kind of come and go, but the, the market conditions have, have gotten more difficult over time. And you know, the increase in zero DTE trading uh, it has certainly squeezed margins a little bit. The spreads are tighter. There's plenty of liquidity. Yeah, and and we, are, we are off to the races. And I'm, you know, I'm certainly open to you know, contrary feedback or input. And I certainly want to hear from my, my fellow esteemed panelists. But yeah, this is, that's, uh, that's my two and a half cents. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, you, zero DTs definitely have an image problem. I think JJ mentioned something yesterday about PFOF changing that as well. He doesn't like payment for order flow. Maybe we can uh, you know, start zero DTEs, um, you know, an upgrade you know, you know, to their image. But they've definitely filled the gap, right? Uh, I mean, if, if there was a need in the market for something like this, otherwise we wouldn't see the volume coming into those. And so I think responsibly and, and, and with you know, what we've been doing as an industry, we can support this. And when it comes think- to product introduction, we are being responsible. Right, we as an industry, and I'm not just speaking from a NASDAQ yeah. perspective, you know, as, as, as much as we have kind of driven the bus on the introduction of new product. We listed the Tuesdays and Thursdays in, in SPY, and, you know, and, and what we do as, as exchanges is we gather the input from the industry and we make sure that we're making responsible decisions you know, in congruence with, with everyone's feedback, and we're going to, to push product. We're not going to be listing, you know, Five delta binary twenty to one payout options on Tesla. We're just not going to do that, right? I mean, so we're we're in a place today where you know there appears to be a significant amount of demand for additional product, um, and you know whether it goes down the 
quote-unquote single-stock dailies, which again, weekly options with non-standard expiries, not going to use the term dailies. We're not listing these products the day of or the day before they expire. Right? So you know, we're giving the, the industry an opportunity to absorb the information, to, you know, to develop their risk tolerance, and then develop strategies with which to employ, uh, to, with, with which to deploy capital, uh, either from a retail, institutional, or we'll call it professional you know, with lens. So, it's, so Greg, you mentioned, as, as it pertains to the zero DT options and the growth of those, uh, you mentioned the operations risk. And I think one of the challenges in the industry that they, people are trying to get around to is a lot of the processes in the industry tend to be end of day. Mm-hmm. And when you have an end-of-day process of whether it be allocations or whether it be margin calculations, et cetera, and you're doing that on something that's already expired, it's a challenge. And so the, uh, for a lot of the uh, firms, um, you know, retooling their systems to be able to handle um, uh, trades that, they, that expire even before their, their, their reports run, et cetera, is, uh, is, going to be, is going to be important. And, and uh, before we're going to see the growth, the massive growth of this, I think we're going to have to see some evolution of those back office and operational processes. Not to monopolize the conversation, but I was talking to a dear friend that you know, I had met on my first day on the Amex floor in 1999, and he walks up to me and he says yesterday, he says, uh, if you, you list these single stock dailies, it's going to be a, you know, it, it could be a real problem. And I think the largest risk to retail at that point is naturally corporate actions, events, or news that happens on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, you know, because there is this you know, de facto embargo on, you know, on news events that, that typically happen on Fridays, you know, like an unspoken, you know, we, we don't you know, announce corporate events on Fridays you know, during, during expiry cycles and, and triple witches, et cetera. Yeah, so the biggest risk would be the after-hours moves and, like, what could happen after hours. Professionals are allowed to exercise options, and then, you know, whoever short them subsequently be assigned on options between 4 and 5.30 p.m. And a, an elegant solution if we were to go forward on the path to listing additional products on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday expiries would be to potentially, and I know that the clearing firms in here are going to give me a little stank eye when I say this, <laughs> collapse the window for contrary exercise intent notification to something like 405. That might be an elegant solution. But, you know, we're all talking about this. No decisions are being made in a vacuum. No exchanges is going to be filing with the SEC any kind of product, you know, without some consensus. And the products that are currently in existence with these non-standard expiries, there are exactly... We'll, we'll, we'll call it six, yeah, as far as you know, three equities or three multi-list equities three and, and, and three index complexes, right? So, yeah, yeah SPX, NDX, and RUT, you know, whether it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Monday, Wednesday, um, and then you have you know, Q's, IWM, and SPY. Like, those are the only products that have non-standard experts today. And, you know, I, I think there's, there's room for additional products there, whether they be natural hedge futures correlated products that professionals can kind of you know, duck and weave out of the, the risk of, of those instruments by utilizing other asset classes and other instruments, you know, or other equities that, that might be available for natural, highly correlated hedges. You know, I, I think there's, there's plenty of room there. And then the single stock conversation, again, incredibly responsible with a lot of feedback and you know, continually asking, you know, how can we provide the right product that traders want to trade and that, you know, that, and that would be palatable to regulation, palatable to the, the retail firms and their operational risk items, palatable to the market-making community and their risk tolerance, yeah, and, and that would see additional demand. And so far, those alternative expertise have you know, been wildly accretive to the volume profile of the industry and has helped mm-hmm us on our path to 100% growth in five years. I have to jump in. Oh. Yeah, I mean, please. Oh. I have to jump in here. Um, I feel like, so we have to ask ourselves, also super excited about the zero DTE. Essentially, we have to ask ourselves, why this surge, essentially? So is it um, is it because people are really excited about the exercise? Or is it because people just have small wallet sizes in retail and they want to diversify, and so they, they want to trade these, you know, what they can afford because they can trade 20 of them. They don't have to just put on one position, and then that's it. Everything is locked up in this one or two positions. Um, 
so very complementary um, to everything that you've said, Sean. Uh, that's, we're also trying to build a solution for that. So we're trying to build fractional options. Um, it essentially solves the same problem of uh, retail, uh, retail traders just saying, you know, I can allocate 2% of my portfolio in a single position because now I can buy one one-hundredth of Tesla, Google, Amazon, et cetera. Um, and actually, a couple, when we started Atomic Vault, kind of right before uh, the, you know, a year before the, the huge boom in zero DTE, uh, we conducted uh, surveys with, like, about 200 retail options traders found, you know, found on Twitter. Um, and 90% of them, we asked just one question. It was, have you ever wanted to trade Tesla, Google, Amazon, um, like whatever strike you, you wanted, your initial strike? And you looked at the price and you said, I can't afford that. Or maybe I can't afford that, but it's going to wipe out or it's going to, you know, clog up 20% of my capital into a single position. And therefore, maybe I'll just go super far out in the chain or maybe I just, I'll just not put on this position. And uh, ni- nearly 90% of people said, I've had this problem. I either went super out in the chain or I just, you know, didn't put on the trade. Um, so even, I guess, before that, we could have probably predicted that. Uh, folks, you know, they want smaller options, essentially, is kind of the underlying theme. Yeah, and so the product that you're bringing to market with the fractional options is going to be complementary to the existing products. It's not net new, but you're, you're working on a way to break those contracts up for those smaller wallets that, you know, may want, maybe not a zero DT, but, you know, I mean, you're, you're talking about some longer-term expirations as well, right? You know, focusing yeah. on those. Yeah, definitely. In our surveys, uh, we also found that about 25% of retail traders we interviewed said they want to buy Google or Amazon Leaps. Yep. Um, and so that was one thing, like, just kind of naturally people brought it up themselves. We didn't ask any questions on that. Um, so many folks were talking about leaps, and we're like, we looked at the volumes. We're like, leaps definitely do not cover, you know, 25% of options volumes. Uh, so, you know, is it? We were like, is there no demand for it, or is, or can retail just not afford them, and that's why? And uh, maybe worth, you know, trying to change the industry to allow them to get access to leaps. So, definitely have seen that. So I think, we, I mean, well, we're running up on five minutes. We were going to take some questions from the audience, um, if anybody has one. But in the meantime, um, just, you know, wanted to say, so we've talked about zero DTs, you know, fractional options. You know, what, what other, you know, products, I mean, do we see on the horizon for the retail investor? Is it, you know, extending hours, you know, of trading? Is it international? I think, I mean, you've got some work you're doing on the international side, Ravi, as well. Um, any thoughts on that? So, you know, obviously we've mentioned the fractional, which is really, really interesting, and the leaps, is, that's a fantastic piece of information that I didn't even know about. That's, that's, and, of course, the shorter duration. Um, so I think we've covered a lot of the, um, the new products that seem to be of interest, but uh, uh, contrary to what you said, I think actually there might be in the longer-term horizon, given um, the retail investor, I think things like um, binary options might be actually quite interesting for uh, retail investors, you know, uh, as opposed to spreads where you can't actually monetize it until uh, you uh, go either deep in the money or, or uh, go to expiration. Uh, binary I options. I love that five Delta Tesla product. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that could be, but I think that's, that's much further in the future because there's regulatory issues, et cetera. But uh, I think that would be a fantastic op- uh, uh, product for retail eventually. Um, uh, the... And Greg's doing a great job of setting up the next panel, talking about just the international yeah, right. expansion, <laughs> right. Right? right? So, I, and and if you look at, you know, kind of also staying with the with the topic on mm-hmm. on shorter duration trading, if you look at the open interest profile from the one day to expiration to the zero day to expiration, if you just look at the overall growth of open interest over the life cycle of an option. Between day one and day zero, there is a significant drop-off in open interest. Mm -hmm. And part of that is due to many international firms, many international retail firms, not allowing their uh, their traders and and participants to hold options on the date of expiration and making them actually liquidate those positions the day before. Um, That's part of that reason, but also natural closing, Mm -hmm. which also reduces the risk element. 
It's amazing. All right. Any questions from the audience? We maybe have time for one or two. All right. Uh, well, then, what I would say: uh, any final comments from the, you know the panel that you would want to uh, share? You know, as we're almost uh, done here. I've talked enough. I yield my time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess on the international topic, since it's a good segue, anyways. Um, a lot of interest that we're seeing uh, in, you know, a lot of neo brokers popping up in Asia. Um, I think Asia will, if I were to predict anything, um, usually my predictions are wrong, but I'm high confidence about this one. Um, I think that uh, Asia is going to be a huge driver in increase in options volumes in the next couple of years. Um, I think the last thing I'll say is that, you know, we saw a huge growth in the um, in uh, retail participation. And I think we're seeing now sort of a graduating class from that first wave of participants that are getting more educated, the more they've, uh, they've burnt their fingers on some of those uh, uh, options. And they're demanding more, uh, of course, ability to trade spreads, to short options, but also better tools and better analytics. And so I think from the industry we're going to see, especially from the technology industry, a lot more uh, sophisticated tools on their phones that they can, uh, you know, use to analyze and 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 uh, and, um, and you know, up their trading to uh, to a more sophisticated strategies. I think we're going to see a lot of that. All right. All right. We've got another minute. Why not? <laughs> um, asset class expansion, you know, into into potential. It depended upon how the regulatory regime shakes out. You know, potentially moving into some more leverage and or optionality style products on digital assets. Uh, you know, there's there's already been a significant amount of growth, especially on on the retail side in the the futures landscape. Trading more index and and ETF options, different types of ETFs with option wrappers, right? Uh, and and you know, and just to kind of go back and circle back, you know, zero DTE and the phenomenon that is that that is that uh, rhetoric, you know, for the risk that's introduced from these products you know, is, is not Volmageddon 2.0. Mm-hmm. It is that there is no comparison, zero correlation mm-hmm. between any of the data that, that we've consumed and distributed. And you know, NASDAQ has a few blogs coming out over the next couple of weeks. Check them out. Shameless plug. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's it for us. Thanks to my panel. Thanks to the OIC, Julie Trish, for putting on a great event. And thank you. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.